Um, in this section, Richard Dawkins will be talking about Harun Yahya's, um, I can't read, Atlas of Creation. With, without much ado, we'll go straight to Richard Dawkins. Thank you very much. I'm truly delighted to be here, and I want to salute uh, those uh, ex-Muslims who are prepared to stand up and say that that's what they are, and may you be the nucleus of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions more uh, who do the same thing. I am a great admirer of Al Jazeera's English language service, and I was therefore very shocked when I saw a couple of days ago the, the um, Arabic version of Al Jazeera with subtitles in which they um, interviewed this man, Harun Yahya, um, whose real name is Adnan Oktar. He's an extremely naive creationist. And in exactly the opposite spirit to Al Jazeera's English language service, the Arabic language service, swallowed it hook, line and sinker. And I got the impression that we are divided, that there's a... That it, that I, I would have got the impression from this Al Jazeera broadcast that the whole of the Islamic world is completely and utterly taken in by the uh, naive pseudoscience which is creationism. Adnan Oktar, alias Harun Yahya, uh, stands for that. He's also a, a very unpleasant man. Um, nobody could say that he doesn't have balls. And he, he shows this in, in various ways. When, when my book, The God Delusion, first came out, he succeeded temporarily in getting the publisher and translator arrested for blasphemy. Uh, in the last few weeks, he has succeeded in persuading a Turkish court to ban my website, richarddawkins.net. Uh, and he's said to have sued me for 8,000 Turkish lira that's 3,300 British pounds. Um, his lawyers have listed phrases and sentences that I wrote on my website, which they claim assault his personal rights. Um, weirdly, I learned about this suit, this lawsuit, all secondhand from newspapers. I've received not the slightest communication from his lawyers, from him, or from any Turkish court, uh, but I'm advised by uh, friends in Turkey that I ought to be hiring a lawyer in spite of the fact that nobody's even approached me with this, with this suit. That seems to be the way they do it. Um, anyway, the first thing we did when we heard about this was to get uh, my entire article, the one that offended him, translated into Turkish and uh, we put it up on the website because needless to say the attempt to ban it in Turkey is pretty futile. It's very hard to ban a website and there are large areas of Turkey where it can be seen, and it's now been picked up by other Turkish websites. Uh, for example, this one, that's again an, a, another Turkish translation of the article which has offended uh, Harun Yahya. He is widely known for writing a large number of books, uh, most notably Atlas of Creation, which has been distributed free to enormous numbers of science teachers uh, around the world. And when I say free, the, the sheer scale of that operation is mind-boggling. This book is a, a large format book. It's uh, got 764 pages. Every one of those pages is high gloss paper with gorgeously reproduced photographs of animals on every page. I took the book yesterday round to uh, Oxford University Press and I had three people there uh, try to cost out what it would cost to produce this book. And they thought that the, that the, uh, the, the cost of producing um, these, uh, something, did somebody say 10,000 copies to, to, to me today being distributed free, that would be about uh, half a million pounds. So um, this is a free gift from somebody where the money comes from, nobody seems to know. Um, 
I'll come to that in a moment. To give you an idea of the size of the book, the dog is intended to give scale. Um, I would like to think it also gives offence. As for where the money comes from, I think it would make a nice assignment for an investigative journalist to try to work that out. Does it come from Adnan Oktar himself? Well, he's certainly not a poor man, as you saw from that James Bond villain picture that I had up at, at first. Um, and just recently, uh, he has, this is, a, this is from The Independent, um, he has offered a prize to anybody who can produce an intermediate fossil, an evolutionary intermediate fossil. The size of the prize is 10 trillion Turkish lira, which is equivalent to 4.4 trillion British pounds. <laughs> that is 36 times <laughs> the gross national product of Turkey. It's more than the gross national product of Germany, France, Britain, Italy and China combined. 13 times the wealth <laughs> of Bill Gates. So perhaps we should all put in for it, but I'm going to tell you at the end that his idea of what would constitute an intermediate fossil is a fairly odd one. Uh, now, on to the book. <laughs> on to the book itself. Um, unlike most Christian fundamentalists who think the world was created in six days, 6,000 years ago, Adnan Oktar is an old earth creationist. He understands what fossils are and he agrees that they're old. His one point, which is bludgeoned home on every single page of this enormous book, is that ancient animals haven't changed. So that's his strategy, quite different from the Christian fundamentalists. His strategy is on every page he has a fossil and then next door to it he has a modern animal and he says, look, they're exactly the same as each other. I'm going to show you a few examples to show the depth of his zoological erudition. Uh, the, the first one on the left is a crinoid. A crinoid is a so-called sea lily. It's a member of the phylum Echinodermata. Uh, it is a relative of a sea urchin. It's a kind of sea urchin on a stalk. That's a fossil. On the right is what he says is exactly the same. What that is, is a sabellid worm. It's, a, it's an annelid worm. It's related to earthworms. It's nothing whatever to do with echinoderms. Um, to, just to give you an idea of that, that's a very, very crude uh, taxonomy of the animal kingdom according to uh, modern zoology. You see that the animal kingdom is divided up into two main branches. On the left, we have the so-called protostomes. This is all based on embryological criteria. On the right, we have the deuterostomes, and this is a major, major division of the animal kingdom. These are two sub-kingdoms. An animal in the protostomes and an animal in the deuterostomes could not be more different from each other while still remaining members of the animal kingdom. And uh, the sabellid worm, you see up at the top left, is an annelid, it's a protostome, and the crinoid uh, is an echinoderm, it's a deuterostome. These things could not be more different if they tried, unless they became a plant or something. Here's another example. Uh, the fossil there is an eel, uh, and he says it's 95 million years old, I have no reason to doubt that. Um, the modern animal, which hasn't changed at all since the fossil eel, that's not an eel at all, it's a snake! It's a sea snake, a poisonous sea snake. You've probably seen them if you've dived in tropical waters. Um, it's a poisonous uh, sea snake belonging to the genus Laticorda. Once again, you couldn't be more different if you, if you tried, so long as you stay a vertebrate. This is the champion one of all. Um, there's a caddis fly in amber, which is 25 million years old. And look, it hasn't changed at all to the modern one. The modern one, the modern caddis fly, is a tide fishing fly. 
and it's still got its hook. <laughs> Now, you might put that down to not just ignorance, but sort of carelessness. Um, maybe he didn't look very carefully, but I tracked this down to the website where he stole it, uh, which is a website of a, of a champion um, fishing fly tire. Uh, and um, th there it is. And you notice that the background, you see that sort of grey bit in the background? He's cut it out. He must have worked for a long time in Photoshop <laughs> on this picture. And he still didn't spot that hook. Or else, <laughs> or else maybe he thinks that caddis flies really do have hooks. <laughs> Well, as I was browsing this um, Fishing Fly Tires website, I came across something else which I thought looked familiar. Um, that's um, a spider made by the fly tire. It's an it's a artificial spider, very beautifully tied, obviously, and I'm sure it's very tempting to the fish for whom it was designed when on the end of a hook. But I thought it looked familiar, and I, I went back to Harun Yahya's book, and sure enough, There it is. Uh, and um, look, it hasn't changed at all from the one in amber up at the top. Well, <laughs> you can't really see very much of the one in amber. But it doesn't, e even if that was a real modern spider, it wouldn't really make the case very convincingly. Uh, yeah, that's a brittle star, um, and the modern one is a starfish. And again, you can't get more different as long as you stay an echinoderm. Um, now, back to the fossil, uh, the prize for the fossil intermediate. Um, I wanted to make the point that he's got a very, very weird idea of what an intermediate would look like. This idea of um, there aren't any intermediate fossils is a favorite one of all creationists, not just uh, Muslim ones, but, but Christian ones as well. Their constant refrain is, produce your intermediates. There are no intermediates. The fossil record is completely devoid of evolutionary intermediates. This has always puzzled me because just about every fossil you find is going to be an intermediate between something and something else. And yet they seem to think this is a highly trenchant point that they're making. And it was um, Harun Yahya who finally dropped the scales from my eyes. The reason why these people think there are no intermediates, they've got a very, very weird idea of what an intermediate would look like. Sorry, that's a little slide. Um, there you see a picture that he's... Uh, put together um, with a baby crocodile on the left and a, uh, some sort of ground squirrel on the right. And what he's saying is there are no intermediates between crocodiles and squirrels. <laughs> well, you know, why would you expect an intermediate? <laughs> There exists no transitional form. Darwinists claim, I'm quoting now, that by undergoing minor changes, living beings evolve from one species to another over millions of years. According to this claim, which is refuted by scientific findings, fish transformed into amphibians and reptiles transformed into birds. This so-called transformation process, asserted to last for millions of years, should have left countless evidence in the fossil record. In other words, during their intense researches for the last hundred years, researchers should have uncovered many grotesque living beings, such as half fish, half lizard, half spider, half fly, or half lizard, half bird. However, although almost every stratum on Earth has been dug, not even a single fossil has been found that Darwinists can use as evidence for their so-called transition. On the other hand, there are innumerable fossils showing that spiders were always spiders, flies were always flies, fish were always fish, crocodiles were always crocodiles, rabbits were always rabbits, and birds were always birds. Hundreds of millions of fossils clearly show that living beings have not undergone evolution, but were created. Hundreds of millions of fossils prove that living beings did not evolve, but were created. And that picture sums up what he thinks. There's a starfish, there is a fish, and some kind of a photoshopped um, inter intermediate. I finally realized what these people think an intermediate fossil is. 
They think you take a modern animal and you take another modern animal and you get some kind of a halfway between. It may be that the back end is one animal and the front end is another like <laughs> that. Or, or you kind of morph from one to the other. They have the faintest idea what it is that they are criticizing. And I'm, I'm grateful to Mr. Oktar for, uh, for finally opening my eyes to this, to this uh, weird... Uh, to this weird phenomenon. Now, as I said, he has uh, allegedly sued me, uh, and I am going to, I suppose, do something about it. It would be nice if I got some, uh, some sort of official word. What I'm wondering is whether there are any people uh, uh, of, of Turkish origin here who might be able to throw some light on this, this odd phenomenon that um, that, that I, I learned from the newspapers that I've been sued and not from any official source and um, this further and the, and the further um, any, any further advice that you can give is there, is there anybody here of Turkish origin? No? Okay, never mind. Okay, well, um, I, I'm ready to take questions. Thank you very much. Hi. <laughs> no, I think Tur Turkey is, a, is, a, is constitutionally a highly secular country. Uh, so it, it certainly would not be a Sharia accord. Uh, sorry, I, uh, sorry. Oh, right. Okay. Um, any, any questions? Yeah. Uh, have we got a microphone, have we? You just said that um, you didn't, you hadn't come across this idea of strange idea of intermediates, but. Is that, isn't it also current among American creators? Yes, that I is. Mean, things like the croco duck. Yes, you that is. Yes. Um, uh, th there, are, there are American Christian um, creationists who will say, show me a croco duck, or show me a fronky, an in intermediate between a frog and, and a monkey. Um, so um, it, when you think about it, it's no wonder they think that it's difficult to find intermediates. <laughs> Any more, any more questions there? Yeah. Richard, um, Harun Yahya has makes a big fuss on his website and in his press about how he's challenged you to a debate or invited you to a debate and that you've declined. Is that the case, and would you ever consider, or under what conditions would you consider debating him? I always decline debates with creationists. Uh, I, I've done this ever since um, asking advice from Stephen Jay Gould, who did the same thing. Um, if, you, if you agree to have a debate with them, what you're doing is giving them legitimacy. You're saying there is a serious scientific matter to discuss. Here we are sitting on a platform. It gets even worse when you have the elaborate legalistic rules of debate. Uh, you have 20 minutes for the proposition, 20 minutes for the opposition, five minutes to reply, five minutes to reply. It all creates the illusion that there is some real issue to debate. I hope that I've shown you from these just half dozen slides that the debate would be simply ridiculous. I mean, th this man doesn't know anything about zoology. He doesn't know anything about biology. He knows nothing about the evolution that he is attempting to refute. He's a complete and utter ignoramus. Many people are. Do you want to use the mic? Because I think it might uh, be It was originally presented to the London Business School, but they thought it was inappropriate to their uh, field of inquiry. So eventually, <laughs> it landed up there. I don't know what we've done with it, but I, if, if I would like to present it to the society if they have sufficient <laughs> space to store it. Well, um, no doubt that will be gratefully received, or will it? I'm not sure. Uh, uh, somebody, yes, there. Who, who's got the mic? Uh, we were talking about, um, you know, I, I can't help it because I see all these as a, 
not a conspiracy theorist or something, I hate it, but as a movement that is just beyond uh, some scientific discussion, as you said, it's not science really. So what is the, uh, the alliance behind all this propaganda in US, in everywhere? So let me draw the attention again to Saudi Arabia, for example. Do you know about their biology education? Do they have creationism? Could it, could it be them to support this book? Or do I, they really respect science? I don't know the answer to that question. I can guess, uh, but, and I, I dare say there may be some people here. My understanding is that um, since Islam takes the Quran literally, whereas Christianity doesn't, except for certain branches of, of, of Christianity, we would expect that the norm, the default position for Islam would be that every word of the Quran is literally true. And therefore, uh, that um, the, this, the story of creation would be taken as literally true, and the story of Adam and Eve is taken as literally true, etc. But there are many people in the room who can perhaps um, disabuse me of that. I, my impression is there's, there's very little evolution taught in, uh, in countries that are dominated by, by Islam. Ibn, do you, do you know whether, whether that's true? I, I, I don't know that. No, okay. Yes. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. Thanks, I'm Usman. Thanks for your talk. I was just I'm wondering whether you'd heard of um, Pervez Hoothboy in Pakistan and his um, work. I mean, he's a, I think he's a rationalist scientist and he's written a lot about how, I mean, just as in the evolution thing you've talked about, how physics department in the University of Punjab in Pakistan, where he's fought a battle against um, religious scientists who try and show that there's a causal effect between praying and rain happening. And I mean, he's produced a lot of videos and things to rebut this. And I was wondering, you mean, perhaps through a foundation or anything like that, whether there was a way to finance these kind of projects supporting rationalism? I mean, because the odds are against us in many parts of the world. Uh, yes, thank you for that suggestion. I was not aware of this particular individual that you mentioned, but obviously, I, from what you say, I salute him. And um, I, I would be interested in trying to support such people. Thank you. Um, y yes. Um, just an answer to your question about evolution in uh, Islamic, sorry, in Islamic countries. I'm from Syria, and uh, in our science books, we do have um, the talk, they do talk, say something about evolution, uh, the books. However, the teachers they um, abstain from teaching the theory, and they, um, I mean, as I remember, as a student, they told me, the teachers told us that you don't have to go through it and read it because you won't be asked about it in examination, so they just completely ignore it. I mean, suppose Syria is more liberal than other countries, but um, that, that's the case. Thank you, that's useful. That's the same in, men, in some parts of America as well. Um, yes, 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 okay. Yeah. Well, a dead end, I suppose, would just mean a, a, a lineage that died out, of, of which there are vast numbers. That's certainly true. Um, so they wouldn't look like intermediates, necessarily. Um, but, but, I mean, is something, more, something more than 99% of the species that have ever lived have gone extinct. And so in, in that sense, they're dead ends. Um, I think we, yes. Oh, hello? Uh, yes? Who, else, who am I looking at? Okay, yes. Oh, okay. We'll have one. Is, is the microphone going upstairs? Or if you could repeat your question. I could repeat the question, okay. Um, yes. Y y Um, the, um, she, the, the questioner has, has, has recently met people who believe in an Abrahamic deity and in evolution. What's that about? Well, that, that, I mean, that, that's true of, of most respectable 
Christians and, and Jews. Um, it, it, it is true of the Archbishop of Canterbury, it's true of the Pope with certain reservations, um, it's true of uh, m most of the bishops and um, educated priests. So there's nothing unusual in nowadays in combining belief in an Abrahamic deity and in evolution. When you say, what's that about? I mean, I agree with the implication of your question that there is a certain incompatibility, but that's not the way they see it. <laughs> yes, that's the one next door. That, now we've got a microphone too. Hi, I'm from uh, Pakistan. I teach uh, at university there. And uh, first of all, I'd like to say that the lady who recommended Purvez, Hood Boy, that's an excellent recommendation. Uh, he is uh, arguably the foremost rationalist and scientist in Pakistan, and Thank I would you. highly recommend you working with him. Um, when we began to teach, when I began to teach at the Lahore University of Management Sciences, and I was teaching in part uh, sections of your book, The God Delusion, um, and my friend in, in, the, in the biology department was also teaching uh, evolution. Suddenly, at our university, we saw uh, this, this series of books come into the library of Harun Yahya and the, the right-wing faculty members began to encourage our students to read Harun Yahya, particularly in opposition to what you had been writing. Um, so I'm wondering if you are intending to or have already written anything that specifically, as your talk does today, specifically answer to some of the rubbish that he's been putting well, in Well, I mean, th there is the article on my website, which is the one that precipitated his, uh, his uh, temporarily successful attempt to ban the website. So that's richarddawkins.net, and then if you search for Yahya, um, you'll, you'll find it. And that has, I think, most of the pictures, um, not, not, not the one of the incontinence pad, but, um, the, um, but the ones of the various, um, that was the, okay, never mind. <laughs> um, the, the ones of the various animals are, are all there. I mean, I, I should call your attention, call the attention of your students to these spectacular howlers like the fishing hook and the, um, and the, and the snake and the, and the eel and the crinoid and the, and the sibelid worm. Yes. Oh, sorry, he's mic the mic's up there. A any more upstairs before we... Yeah. Do you agree with Steve Jones that evolution has come to an end or stalled? And are we uh, the living end of... I, I think evolution? since that's got so little to do with this Islamic conference, I, I, I'll duck that question. It's the commonest question I get asked after every lecture, um, and I can hold forth for half an hour. But I think, with, with your forgiveness, I won't. I, we better wait for the mic. Well, I, I can repeat the question, okay. Yes. Um, the questioner is proud to be an ape, and so am I. Um, is this told to children in non-faith schools, or indeed, I suppose, in, in faith schools? I, I don't think that many people, even who teach evolution, actually tell children, you are an ape. It would be a very good thing to do, because it's, it is literally strictly true. It's strictly true in the, in the following sense. Um, if you plot a tree diagram, like the one I showed you, of the protostomes and deuterostomes, um, humans come in the middle of the ape tree. So what that means is that humans are closer cousins to chimpanzees than chimpanzees are to gorillas or orangutans. Therefore, if there is a thing called an ape, which includes chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas, and gibbons, then it cannot exclude humans. There is no zoological category, no taxonomic category, which includes chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas, and orangutans, and gibbons, um, and excludes hu humans. So um, we are apes, we are African apes. Since we're closer to chimpanzees and bonobos than either of them is to gorillas, we are a particular subset of African apes united with chimpanzees and bonobos, but excluding gorillas. So we are undoubtedly um, African apes by any standard at all. Uh, yes. 
D tell me when I got to stop. Who's, who's chairing this? Richard, I'm, uh, I've been looking, while you've been talking, I've been looking at the picture up on the screen. And um, clearly that's ridiculous, but I can, I can see a lot of non-technical, non-scientific people who don't really understand evolution for whom that might be seductive. Um, what I'd like to see is um, a book, you could call it Evolution for Dummies if you like, but a book that would, it, with lots of pictures in a Dorling Kindersley fashion, explain it properly to people who perhaps would never pick up one of your, your usual tomes. Is there a book like that you can recommend or is that something you might take on as another project? Well, I get the feeling there are Dorling Kindersley type books uh, around. Um, I can't actually think of any names at the moment. I'm surprised you think anybody would be persuaded by that, although apparently they are, um, and, unless they were indoctrinated as children, which I suspect is the real problem that underlies really everything we've been talking about t today. Um, you asked whether I would undertake such a book. I am planning a children's book. Uh, probably, I w wasn't actually thinking of a picture book like that, but perhaps you're right. Perhaps that would be the right way to do it. But I, that's the book I hope to write next year. Two more questions, perhaps? Uh, yes, there. The, the question is about uh, uh, the Reverend Professor Michael Rice, um, who was employed by the Royal Society as their education spokesman and who um, was somewhat pilloried for uh, saying uh, in a speech at the British Association and in a, an accompanying article uh, that the right way to handle creationism in schools is to um, treat the question uh, sympathetically, to show respect for the um, for the uh, religious beliefs of, that the children have been indoctrinated in. He didn't say he didn't put it like that. Um, and um, rather than... Uh, um, and it, it, this, this was, I, I think, to be fair, I think this was misinterpreted by some newspapers as uh, saying that he was advocating the teaching of creationism. Um, there was an almighty furore at the Royal Society um, and... Uh, under, the, under pressure of numerous letters from eminent scientists, including, I think, at least three Nobel Prize winners, um, Michael Rice resigned. Um, I, I, I think that, it, that there was an element of unfairness in that, in that he, he, what he actually said was probably not too objectionable. Uh, the problem really... I suspect, to be honest, was that, 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 he, that he's a reverend. And therefore, in a way, he was the very last person who, from a purely political point of view, should have been saying that because he was unfortunately vulnerable to the, well, he would say that, wouldn't he, accusation. If somebody like me had said it, uh, I'd probably have got away with it fine. Um, but uh, I think it brought out... The, the somewhat anomalous position, well, more than somewhat, that the Royal Society had employed a clergyman as their uh, education spokesman in the first place. And I think that was really the, the source of that um, rather unfortunate episode. Yes, one more. Okay, um, I think that gentleman there. Thank you. Um, I think the underlying theme of your talk is that uh, science today is uh, being challenged. Uh, rationality is being challenged by a religion, by superstition, by misguided dogmatism. And also in these days of dwindling funds and dwindling student numbers in engineering and science, uh, we're also seeing that things like this are being uh, funded in uh, oil barrel loads of money. What's the answer? How do we uh, turn this back? I wish that the answer was as simple as just simply lay out the facts and show people how obvious they are and how easy to understand they are. Um, that's the policy that I have adopted throughout my entire career, uh, through, through nine, ten books. Um, it works for some people, but I'm afraid it's becoming increasingly clear that it does not work 
for people whose childhood indoctrination, imprinting one might almost call it, is sufficiently strong. Um, the most dramatic illustration of this I know is a man called Kurt Wise, who's an American geologist who uh, did, um, he did a degree at the University of Chicago. He then did a doctorate at Harvard in geology under Steve Gould, no less. And uh, he then became uh, um, aware that the geology he was learning was, um, he became increasingly aware that it was incompatible with the religion of his childhood, which was fundamentalist Christianity. And he dramatically describes how he got a pair of scissors and a Bible. And he went right through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, cutting out every verse that would have to go if he took science seriously. And it says at the end that having gone through this exercise, there was so little left of scripture that it just fell apart. There was nothing left. And he said, that night, in great sorrow, I tossed into the flames, and you hope he's going to toss the Bible into the flames, but no, I tossed into the flames all my hopes and aspirations to be a scientist and a science teacher. He gave up science. Uh, and then he goes on to a sort of final peroration where he says in this article, if all the evidence in the universe uh, demonstrated a young, sorry, an old earth, if all the evidence in the universe showed, showed that the Earth is old, I would still be a young Earth creationist because that is what Holy Scripture tells me. Now, I f find myself powerless against that. I find myself despairing against somebody who can actually, after a Chicago Harvard education in science of the best possible kind in the world, can stand up and say, if all the evidence goes one way and Scripture goes the other, I'm going to go with scripture. What chance have we got when the indoctrination, the imprinting of childhood leaves a mind so wrecked as that? Richard, that was absolutely wonderful. Incoming chair, Keith Fortress Wood. I don't think I can let it last just to leave at that very last moment. I'm going to ask you to say something positive about what the people in this room and what a magnificent group of people dedicated to science are here. Can we ask them to do something politically? We can see they can't do it through persuading people, but is there something we can persuade them to do politically and, and through the media and that kind of thing to? to actually start pushing the boundaries back towards rationality. I hate ever to quote Tony Blair, <laughs> but uh, I suppose the, 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 the beginning of an answer has to be education, education, education. And I don't know quite how one seizes the, the reins of education, but it, it does seem to me that if, if any people know in their local communities that there are schools where children are being indoctrinated with, with, um, with false nonsense, palpable nonsense. I don't mean genuine controversy where one's taking sides. I'm talking about obvious palpable nonsense, such as young earth creationism, uh, or even old earth creationism of the Haran Yahya kind. Um, if you know of that and you have any influence in your com communities over what is being taught, that would be uh, one, one place to go. I, d I don't know how one gets influence over education, but I think that's the, that's the point of leverage. Wonderful. Thank you very much indeed.